Hey everybody and welcome once again to Nose in the Book, a Bible reading commentary with me, your host, Pastor Justin Van Reed. So great to have you with me once again as we take a look at five more chapters from the Word of God. We have before us today Ruth chapter 1. Since we finished the book of Judges, we move into the book of Ruth. Uh, in the New Testament, Acts chapter 26, getting close to the end here, uh, Jeremiah uh, 36 and Jeremiah 45. I'll explain that in a moment. Uh, and then back in the Psalms, we're up to uh, Psalm 9. So uh, as it is with all the other days, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to post those in the comment section below. Otherwise, let's go and look at what we've got here. All right, starting the book of Ruth today. And uh, Ruth chapter 1 here begins, and it's very significant, in the days when the judges ruled in Israel. Uh, this famine comes upon the land, and you know this man from Bethlehem takes his family to Moab. Now, why is it significant that it's the days when the judges ruled in Israel? Well, remember in the book of Judges that when there was no king in Israel, every man did what was right in his own eyes. And it's because of this, likely during one of these periods where Israel is defying the Lord, that a famine comes upon the land as judgment for Israel's sin, as we often read about in uh, the Law of Moses. So, uh, furthermore, Elimelech, this man, takes his family, leaves Bethlehem, and goes to Moab, which, um, why would you trust the Moabites? Why would you go to live amongst the Moabites instead of your own people? Uh, because everyone does what is right in their own eyes, including Elimelech. And so he takes Naomi, his wife, and their two sons, and um, and they go to Moab, and they both find wives there, um, the Malon and Kilion, and um, they marry Orpah and Ruth. And both Malon and Kilion die in Moab. Perhaps it's a judgment on the Lord for sin here, or perhaps he just died because uh, natural you know, reasons of life. But either way... This leaves Naomi alone with her two, with, um, without her two sons or her husband. So all three of the men die. Um, Orpah decides she's going to stay, right? Because Naomi is going to, right, things are better back in Judah. So Naomi's going to return. And um, she tells uh, her daughter, daughters-in-law, the two of them, go, go home. And, um, you know, you've been good daughters-in-law, but go home. And Orpah does, but Ruth decides she's going to stay with Naomi. And so um, Ruth says to Naomi, this is very significant here, wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. Wherever you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord, Yahweh, the God of Israel, punish me severely if I allow anything but death to separate us. So, probably unlike Orpah, Ruth has become converted to following the God of Israel um, and through her time you know, with Elimelech and Naomi and their family. And so, Naomi takes Ruth back to Judah, to Bethlehem, and... Um, Naomi says, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara, which means bitter, because that's how life feels for her. She, she went away, big family, you know, you know, lot, lot, lots of good social stands. She comes back empty. She says, all I got is Ruth, basically. Um, and so the Lord has sent tragedy upon me, and so call me bitter. And so here's how the chapter ends with this summary that they arrive in Bethlehem, and it's the beginning of the barley harvest, and that'll come back in the rest of the book of Ruth. So that's our introduction to this uh, event here in the time of the judges. And it does act as a pivotal story as we move from Judges to Samuel and the arrival of the first kings, in particular the second king of Israel. All right, going back to the uh, New Testament here, Acts chapter 26. And we left off Paul before uh, Agrippa and... Um, and Festus, and so he is going to um, give his speech here. Agrippa says, go ahead, Paul, give your defense. And so, you know, Paul recognizes that Agrippa uh, knows all about, you know, Judaism, knows all about the prophets, knows all about Jewish customs. Um, and so he says, you know, basically he gives his testimony here. He says, you know, I, I've done not, really I've done nothing wrong. I'm seeking after the Lord here. Um, you know, I'm, I'm 
everything I say is in line with even the Old Testament scriptures. And he, you know, but he says, I used to do everything against this Jesus of Nazarene, of Na, uh, the Nazarene. Um, I was persecuting them, but one day on a mission to Damascus, uh, he says, I was on the road, a light from heaven shone. Uh, we all fell down, and I heard this voice, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Uh, why are you kicking against the goads or fighting against my will? And uh, Jesus uh, is the one speaking to him, tells him he's going to go to the Gentiles to give the gospel to them. And he says, so basically, I obeyed this vision from uh, heaven. He lays out what the following steps were, how God protected him, how the Jews were persecuting him. And, uh, and he says uh, at the end here, I teach nothing except what the prophets and Moses said would happen. The Messiah would suffer and be the first to rise from the dead. In this way, God would announce, uh, in this way, announce God's light to Jews and Gentiles alike. And Fest is like, Paul, this is crazy. I mean, think about what you just said. You've been studying too much. Paul replies, I'm not in, uh, insane. This is the truth. Uh, Agrippa knows the, the scriptures. He says, Agrippa, you believe the prophets, right? I know you do. So this is, um, you know, th this should not come as a surprise to you. And, you know, Agrippa, he says here, do you think you can persuade me to become a Christian so quickly? And Paul just wants Agrippa to understand these things. But, you know, the fact that Agrippa ends here by saying he could have been set free if he hadn't appealed to Caesar makes me think Agrippa's really throwing this around in his mind and understands what Paul's saying and understands, yeah, this doesn't sound as crazy as Festus was making it out to be. So that's Acts chapter 26. But Paul's appealed to Caesar, so he's going to head to Caesar. All right, back to the Old Testament. We have Jeremiah 36 and Jeremiah 45. And the reason we have both of these chapters today is because they both have to do with this Baruch. And Baruch um, is the scribe for Jeremiah. So in Jeremiah chapter 36, we read about uh, the instruction of the Lord to Jeremiah to get a scroll and to, uh, to have Baruch write down what the Lord says. So, um, so Baruch becomes the secretary here. The Lord speaks to Jeremiah. Jeremiah dictates it to Baruch. Baruch writes it down. And, uh, you know, Baruch goes and he it, it goes before basically various important VIPs here in uh, Israel, in Jerusalem, and, uh, you know, reads this scroll. And, you know, after person after person hears, they're like, we, we got to get this to the king. We got to get Jehoiakim to hear this. So, um, they bring the scroll to Jeho Jehoiakim, and as they're reading it, it says, It was late autumn. The king uh, was sitting by the fire to keep warm. And as this Jehudi would read three or four columns, the king would take a knife, cut off the scroll, and throw that section into the fire, just section by section. Okay, blah, 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 cut, fire. Blah, 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 cut, fire. Right? Jehoiakim wants nothing to do with this because it, it's all negative messages. Right? It's about what's going to come. I mean, unless the people repent, but obviously Jehoiakim is not interested in that. He's not interested in hearing about the Babylonians coming against him. So Jeremiah, um, you know, after the event here, replaces the scroll, dictates again to Baruch with much more information. Now, after this, we have uh, Jeremiah chapter 45, and uh, here we have a record of Baruch who uh, is upset because you know, his career you know, for Jeremiah has been recording these uh, negative messages against Jerusalem and about the coming of the Babylonians. And so he says, yeah, you know, I'm overwhelmed with trouble. You know, it's just a life of pain. And now it's even more, the more messages you give. Um, but uh, he's instructed here by Jeremiah, this is what's going to happen, right? What, what are you interested in? Are you interested in the truth? Or are you interested in you know, life feeling good for you or going well for you? All right, so that's Jeremiah 36, Jeremiah 45. And then last we come to Psalm 9 here. And you know this kind of goes back and forth. Uh, Psalm of David, he's rejoicing in God's deliverance. Uh, he's praising the Lord who reigns. He says the Lord reigns forever, executing judgment from his throne. He talks about how his enemies came against him, but the Lord delivered him. However, he needs more help. So he you know, goes about sing praises to the Lord. But then verse 13, Lord have mercy on me. My enemies torment me. And so he needs salvation again. And so more help is needed. And, and then he calls for God to judge the nations. He says the wicked will go down to the grave. This is the fate of all the nations who ignore God. So arise, O Lord. Do not let mortals defy you. Judge the nations. Make them tremble and fear. Let the nations know they are merely 
human. So that's Psalm 9. All right, that's all we have time for today. Again, we had Ruth 1, Acts 26, Jeremiah 36, and Jeremiah 45, and Psalm 9. Hope you enjoyed your time in the Lord's Word today. Until next time, keep your eyes on the Lord and your nose in the book. We'll see you again soon.